Et donc Graham Revel abordera tout au long de cette présentation la façon dont il a pu inscrire la, la pensée de l'antipsychiatrie dans une pratique artistique multimédia qui a des résonances très actuelles dans euh, des pratiques euh, des, 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 euh, des pratiques que, que, que nous croisons aujourd'hui autour de la vidéo, euh, de la musique, d'une scène multimédia expérimentale ou non d'ailleurs, euh, et autour notamment d'une circulation accélérée euh, entre les euh, médias. Donc cette séance sera euh, en anglais, on va parler pendant une heure, une heure trente, et ensuite évidemment euh, on ouvrira le, 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 le débat avec vous. Euh, N'hésitez pas si vous avez des, des questions euh, à, à poser euh, à Grand Revol, c'est. Le moment, bien évidemment, ce sera en anglais. Donc, je vais essayer de switcher en anglais. Um, so, Graham, thank you very much to be there. We are so delighted to, to have you tonight. Thank you. And thank you for coming, everybody. But you pretty much said it all. I can understand French, I can't speak it, but we might as well go now. You said it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how did you start simply to. Um, <coughs> make some experiments in the 70s and I understood uh, that uh, SPK began as a collaboration between you and a former psychiatric patient uh, in Sydney, Stefan Neal, right? Stefan Hill. Stefan Hill. Yeah. He was um, kind of a, a patient. He would check himself in, but he was also a nurse sometimes, so he was on both sides of the, uh, the medical equation. And um, a in, very interesting guy. and. Uh, Um, he was the one that was uh, <clears throat> most interested in the, uh, the collage art to begin with, and I was more of um, uh, sort of reading uh, French philosophy mostly and translating it to him at night and um, explaining why we were doing what we were doing. It was all, and uh, I did. I started with the music. I borrowed a synthesizer of a friend, and. Um, You know, just began making uh, making making sounds. Even though I was a, somewhat of a trained musician, I was much more interested in breaking um, all the trajectories of, of music at the time. And uh, we collaborated on two or three singles, and then one, no, just some singles really. And then uh, I came to Europe, and um, He was unable to. He was he was too sick. He was in a codependent relationship and eventually committed suicide, which was a shame. And we were very interested in the in the, um, uh, you know the original SPK. So I think one time uh, one day we said, well, what do we call what we're doing? And uh, we said, well, we could either have be be vain and just make up a random name, or we could uh, commemorate something which we thought was very very interesting in the psychi anti psychiatric field. And by the way, I was a I was a nurse at this asylum, but I think Nicholas already said that. Um, could we say maybe uh, that the post-industrial uh, context of the 70s and the 80s uh, influenced the aesthetic of your project? I mean, for example, the first album uh, named Information Overload Unit uh, was recorded uh, in a squat. I caught this book. It's a selection of uh, Estekel's writings. A busy rail line lay on one side of the squat and a building under demolition on the other. The sounds were incorporated into the album. We had no choice because, um, I hope this translates when I'm speaking English, but with the squat we were living in was uh, right on the Clapham line, which was the most traveled uh, railway line in London, in England actually. And we would look out the window and there was a, a bridge that the train would go across about every three minutes. And it only had three legs, this bridge. Uh, one was missing, and there were still some old ladies living in the, um, in the building before they were moved out by the council. And I asked the old lady, when did that happen? When did this third leg of the bridge go missing? They said, in 1941. And the council said they'd be around on Tuesday to fix it. So this was 1984, and millions of people were going across this bridge that, you know, Didn't, it was the most dangerous. And um, something had happened with the electricity, so every time a train went by, all sparks would come out of the, out of the uh, uh, outlets. So we, find we, we started off trying to record between trains, but this was impossible, so we just, I think we were just went with, uh, with the electrical interference. And you know, didn't matter with industrial music. <laughs> 
Am I speaking too fast? Or? No? Good? Okay. And could you describe maybe your, your first gigs with uh, SPK? I understood that um, SPK was generally uh, intended to play in bomb shelters and asylums too? Yeah, we did uh, one in uh, the bomb shelters underneath the Sydney Railway. Um, I don't think that was ever recorded. And um, <coughs> then in some pubs and crypts. And um, later on in a, a beautiful, beautiful brickworks, uh, abandoned brickworks, which just became an extraordinary soundscape just for percussion and different recordings. Um, yeah, just trying to find interesting venues for the, the entire context to occur. Yeah, maybe an interesting uh, story about this picture, you know. Yes, we, um, and we used to use uh, sort of uh, discard military equipment. We went to San Francisco and uh, <coughs> one of uh, our uh, colleagues, not really colleagues, but another one of the industrial musicians in um, or performance artists in, in uh, San Francisco had just designed a handheld flamethrower, which basically was just like a, a pistol, but it shot flame straight from here to the back room, back of the room. Um, so that fit in quite well with our, our culture of throwing oil drums at the audience and then running um, away when they threw them back. Mm -hmm. And um, there was a guy in the audience who, um, he had a mohawk, so it was still the punk time, so he spent the entire concert trying to jump up into the flame and eventually succeeded and ran around, the, you know, he, was very, he became very famous. <laughs> and another time I, um, I was swinging a big grappling chain around, which was very long and had a hook on the end, and we used to mic up the floor, all the floor with metal, and the audience would beat on the floor so it was, they would collaborate. And I slipped on this metal, came down, I have no idea where, the, where this hook came down in the audience. And later on, somebody came in and he had this big hole on the side of his skull, blood everywhere. And I'm thinking, oh my god, I'm in trouble here. But all he wanted me was to sign his face with his blood. So this was, this was good times. <laughs> Typical blessed from Typical. the past. Yeah. Those were the days. <laughs> In the bibliography you published in the Industrial uh, Culture Handbook, right here, you mentioned uh, your interest in anti-psychiatry uh, through the writings, for example, of uh, Thomas Sars, but also David Cooper. Uh, what is the meaning of this movement to, to you uh, at this period, during this period? Did you ever meet any of those uh, psychiatrists? No, I didn't. I was in the wrong place. Did David the wrong time. No. <laughs> But Adi Lang was, uh, yeah, I, I was extremely interested in his idea of, um, what do you call it, a coherent uh, self. Was it a coherent self or ontological secure, ontologically secure self? And um, schizophrenia is, is the inability to have an ontologically secure self, um, which was considered, of course, was considered a disease. It still is considered a disease. What R.D. Lang said is that, well, the ontologically secure self is just a mythology that doesn't go back any further than Descartes and Hume. Um, and so that we, we all live in these different uh, epistemologies that, we, that the bulk of people don't realize that they're in. And that schizophrenia, in a way, is is creating strategies to avoid this ontologically secure and very boring self. Uh, Adi Lang took it a, a, a long way further in that he, uh, he completely destroyed his own family because he thought the family was part of the problem. It's a very radical thing to do and it didn't work out well. <laughs> um, but uh, Thomas says uh, his main contribution was, he was not anti-psychiatry, he was anti um, you know, normalizing psychiatry. And he said that um, it's this, he historicized the idea, which is very important, that um, it's the state is what is really controlling, um, you know, what is considered ill and what is considered um, uh, normal. Uh, 
so he called it the therapeutic state. And I think that there's something going back to SBK that I was very interested in. Um, and David Cooper took it one step further. He sort of proposed a schizo revolution, a literal one. Uh, that didn't go very far either. But, yeah, but in a way, what I took from the whole thing was that it wasn't just sort of a therapeutic state, it was the entire epistemology of this fairy to the fairy tales we tell ourselves at a particular point in history. And I really started to have the impression through having experienced schizophrenia in the, in the hospital that this was something that was happening, a change in society was coming. There was something that, at the time I formulated it better later, that schizophrenia was a metaphor for a big change. And of course in Foucault's terms that's called a, a, an epistemological break. And I thought we were, we were right at the beginning of one. And industrial culture was, was speaking, speaking about it. And, and of course no other music was, very little art was. And the field of psychiatry is uh, very important to you, mainly because uh, you were, um, in the late uh, 70s, you worked uh, as a psychiatric nurse at uh, the Colin Park Mental Hospital in Sydney. And the place where, where your responsibilities um, included, quote, uh, dispensation of drugs, administering electroshock and physical restraint of patients. Uh, the link between your multimedia uh, projects, SPK, and uh, the Socialist Patients Collective is also uh, very uh, relevant. So maybe, how did you get the idea to, to, to make this uh, link between your project and the, the original, uh, the original, sorry, SPK? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, um, uh, the asylum I was working in was a very old, um, very old Victorian asylum. Beautiful. It was, a, it, was a, it was a tear garden in the English sense, not the German sense, of um, the most beautiful environment by Sydney Harbour, but the most horrific torture, essentially, which was going on in the inside. And um, nobody was doing anything. The, the staff were just as institutionalized and crazy as the patients. Um, and so Neil and I started to look you know, like what might be happening somewhere else in the world. And this, this was a really, really intriguing uh, experiment. Um, you know, and I suppose, I don't think we ever really wanted to, without, we, we used some of their slogans in our songs like Kill for Inner Peace and Bomb for Mental Health, which was probably going a little far. You know, I never expected to actually do that. But it was metaphorically and uh, um, uh, metaphorically powerful. And, uh, you know, at that time we also um, started to, to, to look at medical museums and the whole, the whole medicalization, basically, of, of, uh, of what is really a societal um, treatment of life and death, where death is hidden, where, um, you know, you never, at that time, you, you didn't actually ever see any real dead bodies. There was some snuff and slash movies around, and that's the only time it was ever even simulated. But <coughs> death was completely um, hidden, and illness was individualized. There was no sense that the society might have a problem. And these people were, were the first to start speaking about it. Yeah, and your, your interest in, in medical imagery uh, appears uh, also in your album, Erlesh and Shrye. Uh, the corpse scream, uh, and it's uh, very interesting because you uh, employed uh, tapes of uh, uh, mountain patients and military training films too, uh, and because the original cover depicted a screaming uh, corpse uh, before a background of an uh, electroencephalography reading during uh, electroshock therapy. Uh, of course, it makes me think about the, the work of which is very different, of course, uh, Carol Rama. I don't know if you, you were aware of this kind of work uh, at, at this period, but, but I wonder, uh, why did you find simply this picture, which, which is very... Um, I, at that time, pre-internet, pre I used to uh, spend half my time in the very back shelves of, of libraries and medical museums and whatever I could find to break into. We had to break into the medical museum, actually. and. Um, but you know, it was 
all the books at the at the back and the back shelves that nobody ever looked at. This one is, is funny actually because it's um, actually a lady who died in her apartment and they found her three weeks later and, and her cat had eaten her face. So um, read into that image quite a little about love and devotion and needing to eat. <laughs> But basically, oh, sorry, um, yeah, of course, essentially, the, it's, the metaphor is, um, is the, the zombification of, uh, of capitalism, I guess. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Which do you like better, the cat story or the zombification of capitalism? <laughs> Your choice. And you, your interest in medical imagery in general uh, can be found in many visuals. Uh, which uh, illustrates articles dealing with uh, uh, torture and military scientific experiments in your booklet, Document 1 and 2, especially, you know, for example. And uh, stress, stress reduction training, the article, deals with a uh, German uh, isolation cell used on Andreas Bader. And uh, when the article, um, Special Programming, sorry, Corps, describes the performance of military soldiers, uh, according to their own physical and uh, physiological conditions. Could you tell us more about uh, the way you found and transformed these uh, images uh, through a recycling strategy? And of course, we can think about the work of uh, Sorin Grissel at the very same moment with uh, the um, uh, booklet industrial news for issues. Yeah, that's strange because um, uh, we did. We didn't know. Uh, the only thing I knew about Throbbing Bristle, I think even about 1978, was um, the one, the first record. I had no idea about any of this other stuff. So we were producing it, perhaps contemporaneously, perhaps a little bit after they did. But we certainly weren't aware of it. So it's, another, it's one of those things, you know, where you get um, different parts of the world. It couldn't happen now because everybody knows what everybody's doing. But um, sort of the rise of, a, of some kind of counterculture in different zones all at the same time. Um, so it, it seems perhaps the zeitgeist uh, coalesced in some way at that time. And uh, what was intriguing was that we were, I think we were all feeling that somehow the, the sort of way of thinking and the way it related to motor production and so on was changing. And that these were very, very crude attempts by the uh, by the status quo to try and hold everything in control somehow. But also with the pornography really to really just sexualize everything, um, to take any kind of privacy from any from anybody and to uh, essentially, you know, the idea being to own your body, to own, for the state to own your body, for the state to own your mind, for, to circumscribe every possible thing that you could think of. And as, a, you know, as a strategy at that time, I think, well, we certainly, because uh, I, when I came to France in 1979, I was very fortunate to um, attend lectures by Deleuze and Foucault, and um, I would have loved to see Baudrillard, but I did not. But um, there, there was still a lot of Marxist talk at the time. There was still quite, there was still quite a binary universe of, um, you know, you, there was this over here, and you could devise a strategy, and then you would overthrow the government, which I think probably Gristle sort of had some idea of, and I, I thought this is highly unlikely, <laughs> and that what this was was more a symptom of um, of disease and cure at the same time. I, I felt like Baudrillard said that the strategy just needed to be catastrophic. You almost had to insert yourself as a um, as a um, retrovirus and become part of the DNA, but to mutate the DNA in some way. So that goes to William Burroughs, which Nicholas will probably talk about. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, video is also very important in your work. Uh, we can see in Despair, for example, in 82. It's uh, actually the original uh, VHS tape. Uh, the reissue in DVD, uh, more recently, and... Do you have a VHS player? Mm -hmm. Yes, 
actually, <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> but uh, maybe we can uh, uh, see a little uh, excerpt and then you can maybe uh, talk about uh, the way uh, you use the infamous story uh, in the medical uh, museum. sections had quite often signed the body, the face, and dated it like a work of art. And I thought, this is odd, this is not about learning. This is, uh, people are, um, uh, they, they think they're creating something. And um, so it was, it was, it was pure art, because I don't think after, you know, like after 70 and 80 something, you're not going to learn anything by hacking a body up. You know, there's perfectly good diagrams and, and uh, videos available by, the, by that time. But um, for me, it became a metaphor of, um, I was very extremely influenced, I have to admit, by um, Deleuze and Guattari's uh, Anti-Oedipus, and then um, Neil Plateau. And, um, the, uh, their mention of Antonin Artaud's body without organs was just so resonant for me when I, when I discovered this process. Um, I, won't, I won't tell French people what Gilles Deleuze said, because I'm sure you all know. But um, essentially, the, the, this period of life and try, and the, it was really the body without organs. We were trying to um, remove the bullshit from music and from art. So it was, it was sort of a, a, a negative period, I suppose. And Light and Shry was the moment where I felt that we had, or industrial music had created what, what I think Guattari called the, um, the catatonic, the cancerous was the first one, the catatonic body without organs, which is removed, but there's nothing happening, there's nothing there. And from then on, we had to figure out how to create the full body without organs. That's coming later. This is what this was all about. A bit literal, I know, but you know. <laughs> Maybe this there also illustrates your expression, Cathedral, Cathedral of Death, that you theorized in um, uh, the post-industrial strategy in the Industrial Culture Handbook. Uh, you wrote, for example, um, this is a text from Industrial Culture Handbook. I call the system as produced a special kind of death, a calculated system of signs. Uh, if the cemetery and the asylum are in the process of disappearing, it is because death is everywhere and no longer needs to be hidden away. Today it is ethnocidal, judicial, concentrational, sensational. A complex fetishism of death has deviant hands Star deaths like Manson, Job Jones, or Vietnam are just part of the system's own socialist fetishism. Your single slogan uh, screams kill, kill, kill for inner peace, bomb, bomb, bomb for mental health, and uh, orders therapies through violence. 
Uh, can we say that this therapy through violence aim, aims to expose the trivialization of violence uh, by uh, the mass media? I mean, SPK blurred in a way uh, the distinction between the ac acceptable and the unacceptable by presenting uh, documentation of actual violence and especially its result. Yeah, I mean, the, um, when you say blur, blur is a, a good word because I think to me it was, the, uh, it was a transition, especially for myself, between a dialectic, which, you know, the idea that you could use this to overthrow that, into a catastrophic, which is a very uh, Baudrillardian idea that you just have to push it to the limit. So, so this, these images um, are produced, but they were hidden. And then at that time, a blurring occurred in art that was mirrored in, uh, by the state. Um, but it was, it, was, it was mirrored by the state in a fetishistic way, which is why I referred to like Jim, uh, Charles Manson and Jim Jones. Um, they were somehow star deviants, whereas what, what the real horror was was statistical death, just like millions of people being killed and nobody ever found, nobody ever knew about it. Um, Vietnam being the obvious metaphor at the time, but it was happening everywhere and still is. I mean, you know, the USA has had how many wars since the last one they actually said they were having? It's one every, one every year, I think, one every two years since 1945. And, uh, you know, drone attacks all the time. So they haven't stopped um, with the statistical death. They've just stopped with the, uh, they've, they've just uh, fetishized it and, and now it's everywhere in movies and so on. But at that time, it was it was quite a radical strategy to uh, to produce these images. So the the strategy was uh, to sort of throw the throw the throw symbols back at, uh, at at the state. I suppose I say the state. I don't mean the government or anything like that. I just mean you know normal, normal society. Right. You also uh, mentioned Baudrillard, the writings of Baudrillard, <coughs> uh, especially the mirror of production uh, that is very important and uh, relevant in your work, um, especially the post-industrial strategy. And you also uh, attend uh, several seminars by uh, Foucault and Deleuze, you said, you said it. I, caught, I started to read Baudrillard, I went to lectures by Foucault and Deleuze. There were the big, cool thinkers of the late 70s and early 80s, and I started to get very interested in the idea of information. Maybe this is the um, or original uh, uh, spirit mind of uh, your first album, Information Overload Unit, through this uh, and McLuhan too. Well, it was very influenced by McLuhan. Yes, sorry. Thank you. I'll get closer. Did you did you meet met uh, met them? Uh, yes. Yeah. But I couldn't speak French well enough, so I was way too reserved to say anything after Bonjour. But um. <laughs> it certainly uh, uh, it was it was an amazing experience, and I still think that um, the way I taught myself French was I joined the uh, Bibliothèque Saint Jean Vier, and I read. Uh, took me six months, I think, to read uh, and translate uh, Différence et Répétition by Deleuze, which I think is one of the seminal texts of what I call the, the epistemological break that we're going through. In the sense that this is the first time since um, really since. Aristotle and categorical sameness and so on. Here's a man who came along and said, no, no, the way we think is through difference. And now you have disruption. Now the entire capitalist world works on this, you know, disruption startup, da 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 da. But it's a, I, I just love it when I think that the day before he published that book, this idea did not exist. Yeah. It's a phenomenal. It's like a song, you know, even your favorite song. There was a day that it did not exist. And it all comes down to, to one mind, one brain. So that's why I was, uh, I was a, an acolyte, definitely. <laughs> and then and shortly after that, um, with uh, Neil Plateau, the, the whole idea of the rhizome, that, that to me is the, is the visual image of what I'm talking about that uh, has happened since we started. And it, and it actually happened 
1980, I think, when they, when they produced the book. Um, it's the, the idea of the tree of life, the sort of the ontological idea that, you know, we've got to worry about being and beginnings and so on. Now the tree is on its side and its rhizome and it's going everywhere. So that's as prefigures the internet by about 10 years. But um, in a way, that, that's, that's the visual image of what I consider our strategy was, and I think industrial music generally. Um, it wasn't a single movement, it didn't have a single manifesto or anything like that. It just had a whole bunch of people doing crazy things, but interesting. You were also very interesting in mind control techniques uh, during the period of SPK, the first one, uh, with uh, the use of ultrasound, so sound as a weapon, drugs on soldier, uh, but also the brain implants of uh, José Delgado and uh, the Nortouch torture. Uh, we can see that um, in uh, information overload unit, units, for example, uh, with an illustration of uh, uh, deprivation uh, of a sensory deprivation display. Uh, how did you discover simply these uh, different uh, mind control brainwashing techniques? Uh, Same way, just um, you know, looking and finding, really, all by accident. Um, but I must say, I did consider this uh, sort of amusing. In a way, it was horrific, I'm sure, for the person that went through it, for people that went through it. But it looks like Frankenstein, doesn't it? It looks like a and, and it was about as effective, you know. It's, um, I'm sure, uh, just an absolute extraordinary waste of time. Once again, the state just trying to, uh, um, trying to keep everything under control, even though it's, uh, it's already, the, the horse is already bolted. But, um, yeah, once again, that just ties into the whole idea of, of what I'm still working on now. Um, which is, um, you know, what, what, how does control work? And, and I, there was a little bit of a schism in industrial music. There were, there were kind of the, um, uh, the people who thought that we were, we were being controlled. You know, some, something outside in a fascist way was controlling us. And then I was more of the uh, impression that we were being seduced into going along with it ourselves, creating it ourselves. And that was the um, that was the future, and that's why I was so excited by um, meeting J.G. Ballard because I thought he was the, the thinker that um, most cleverly and humoristically uh, showed the sort of three the crazy flows of desire, really. And I think it's desire that um, that uh, is the most effective control mechanism. Um, which we see now, you know, it's just everywhere. Sexualization of everything and blah blah. And maybe how did you meet him? Because you made, you conducted several interviews uh, with him, so especially with a research publication in uh, San Francisco <coughs> with Vigel. Oh, Vigel was wonderful. He, um, he was not, I think he had a, a band at one point, but he became a, the archivist really of the whole movement. And um, these documents, the, the Industrial Culture Handbook and the, um, J.G. Ballard are really very, very good, I think. Um, but it was fantastic to meet Ballard because he, he, he spoke, he actually, some, some artists and writers, they, they just are, um, they speak like the book. You know, there's, there was no distinction between the way he thought and the way he wrote. And uh, even though he's a very nice guy and could say, you know, speak conversationally as well, but you would ask them a question and the just most profound answers would come out. But um, he really he really did understand the um, uh, what he called the infantilization of, uh, of um, humans uh, beginning in the, I guess the late 20th century and continuing apace. I actually feel that, that as capitalism has, has shown us, there's a far greater um, and more efficient mechanism of control than, uh, than, than uh, fascism. And, but I say fascism, but I mean, the, there's another question, I think, where I think fascism actually does work the same way. But that's, that was not at the time the, the um, accepted view. 
uh, in a more more global way, um, you um, there are many different references in your work in the work of uh, SPK. Uh, for example, we can find sorry yeah a sculpture uh, of from uh, a Benin bronzes for decomposition. This is a picture of a trepanation, of course, for information of a load unit, and even a bondage photography by Ivan Klaw uh, in uh, From Science to Ritual. How did you proceed to make your own artworks during this period? And uh, maybe uh, did you have in mind the Atrocity exhibition by Ballard uh, when he used these very different visuals, like maybe a, a kind of uh, imaginary museum? Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, definitely the Atrocity exhibition. Um, <coughs> But that it's also it's um, it's self-critical because in for example in using the Benin bronzes, I think that's on the piece which is uh, there's a, a track I think the three ideas at the time culture side which was the idea of um, homogenizing um, and culture and, and destroying them. For example, in Australia, um, I think there used to be a hundred and something Aboriginal languages, and I think there's now only about 40-something left, and half them, only one person speaks. So, um, when I say self-critical, I mean, that when we, I became interested in, in world music, but that I was also very conscious that in becoming interested and inserting myself, that I was probably appropriating in some way. So, um, these are these are images of uh, of appropriation, really. Yeah. You also used uh, disinformation strategy with SPK mm -hmm. in your interviews, mm -hmm. or for the different names. Also, you found for your project like uh, Solipsic, uh, System Planning Corporation, Sepuku, or even Surgical Penis Clinic. You seem to use this strategy uh, as a way to regain control over the power of information held by the mass media of the 70s and the 80s. Could you talk more about the, this kind of strategy you used in different fields? Yeah, I suppose it's a, a pre-Banksy kind of idea. You know? um, there were probably other people doing it, I'm not sure. But uh, yeah, it was uh, you know trying to um, do... Uh, Trying to, to um, be able to do very different styles of music um, without being beholden to um, expectations of marketing. Even even with a very fringe uh, project like this, you you get a, a bunch of people who follow you, um, who kind of resent it when you change styles. Um, so we would um, you know, just change the name and just say, well, it's not the same band. If you like this, that's fine. If you don't, but I'm not going to change uh, my basic program, which is to be rhizomatic, nomadic. You know, I've got all these different interests, and, um, and this is what I'm going to do. And, and so it, um, it was successful up to a point, except that at some point you have to eat. <laughs> And uh, I guess, you know, when you get to the point with Banksy, who I just, everybody has, as like everybody else, really like, um, the brand actually just becomes almost the same as the name, so I'm not quite sure what, whether anything has really changed there. But, um, and the same with us, that's, that's what happens. So in a way, you, you didn't want to participate to an underground culture, the industrial one. Uh, it's very par paradoxical, uh, according to the project of Veil, with the Industrial Culture Handbook. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, uh, do you think today we can talk about industrial culture or industrial counterculture? Yeah, I like that question. Um, when we first started out, I think we were all very um, um, convinced that we were all quite different from each other. We had not, I would always said I was not industrial, way post-industrial, post way ahead of you. And, um, so I think we were counterculture because we didn't really, we didn't feel like we shared anything very much. But in retrospect, and I think um, I spoke to Nicholas before, and he said maybe sometime in the 90s, 
history made it a culture because, um, and it's possibly because of this thing where you start to find categorical uh, uh, similarities. You know, it's just a natural, or well, not a natural, but it's a, a thing historians do, where it's um, where you find the similarities, and, and then it appears to be a culture. So maybe it is. Um, the, uh, what's the def one of the definitions of culture is the whatever people believe at any time. So uh, I'm writing a book at the moment which involves uh, uh, a very important thinker uh, back in the 1860s who nobody, who nobody knows, but he, his idea was that well even cannibalism is a, is a moral cultural choice among cannibals. So this is kind of what we're doing as well. <laughs> I would like to, to return to the, the disinformation strategy because yeah. it was a thematic um, deployed by uh, William S. Burroughs um, and uh, in his writings, uh, among other topics like mind control, language as a virus, etc. How did you meet him? Because it was a case uh, in '82. I yeah, think. So Could you talk about more? Is um, uh, I understood there is a story behind this picture because he's. Well, there's two stories. One is that I um, I uh, took Mr. Burroughs' uh, strategy literally, and uh, when I just after this, I went to Minnesota and um, was at a quite a quite an important art um, institute, and they said, "Well, do you have any publicity?" And I just said, "Well, just say that we're William Burroughs' favorite band," mm -hmm. and so they did. And then I could quote the Minnesota Art Museum because they said that we were William Burroughs' favorite band. So that was, that was successful, and they said we still quote that. Everybody does. <laughs> um, but this story is is uh, this photo. It looks like a bunch of um, young lads all posing like a um, like a band at the time. But in fact, if you look at the the um, body language, we're all a little bit um, embarrassed because uh, uh, it's all like a <laughs> moment, and because. William had just shown us um, some paintings he was doing where he had, uh, he used to do the thing with the spray cans where he would, he, he'd shot his wife uh, and killed her. And there were two, he told two stories very soon after one another. One was that um, uh, he was trying to do William Tell with an apple on her head and missed. And the other one was that he'd been cleaning his gun on the table and it went off. He told those two stories in one day, apparently, to the police. So anyway, he got a suspended sentence from Mexico. He never went to jail. But anyway, he, um, he was doing this art where he was blowing holes in plywood that he'd painted, uh, that he'd stuck uh, pictures of the, uh, of the American Civil War to, and he just blew a hole in it. And I laughed, because you can, you can tell I don't think, take things too seriously. I thought it was funny. Oh my God, he did not think that was funny. And uh, he let us know, and so we were all like, oh shit. No. <laughs> but it looks a very serious photo now, doesn't it? <laughs> but it was great to meet him. He was, he didn't speak very, he didn't speak like Ballard though. He was much more reserved. very different aspects uh, of your work. You were interested for uh, Adolf Wolfi and also Robert Ski. Um, shows another link to psychiatry and maybe to madness too. Uh, how did you discover their, their paintings? That maybe there is a, an interesting story uh, to find the painting of Robert Guy, uh, according to the um, writings of uh, Baudrillard. You, you told me about it now. Well, it's, it's an image that I feel like tie, ties into what I've been talking about. Now, if, you, if you take a, um, you should poll the audience actually, but, uh, most people see that image and see, uh, um, you know, if you know the background as a mental patient, you look at it and you think, well, okay, there's a big head and it's sending out waves, and they're all entering all the little people's heads. And so, 
just because of this size dichotomy, there's a sense that it's a uh, perhaps a paranoid um, statement of, of mind control. Um, for example, one patient I had in uh, Sydney had um, some wires, he said some wires had told him to go out and kill a little boy who was downstairs. It was a very benign little guy, the, the killer. Mm -hmm. And he had obeyed the wires and gone down and killed this little child. And he was now in prison forever, in asylum prison forever. Um, so that's one way of looking at it. But there's also uh, another way, there's a Tibetan Buddhist concept called uh, Spurulpa which is the idea that we create, um, we create uh, uh, mythological images of ourselves outside of the central idea that we have, that they're emanate, it's, called, it's basically emanation in English, that um, these are our, our mythologies of ourself. And this, this really, for me, is like a, an image that, sh that is what I talk about, it, the blurring, the confusion, the catastrophe, the chaos, is that you can see, everything can be seen in two ways, um, you know, just depending on what your point of view is. Uh, Wolf Lee was amazing. I did a record of, of his music, which some of it was quite beautiful. Um, and I visited uh, this collection in La Salle, the Black Museum in, in Switzerland. The amazing stuff. Now it's become a, a massive art movement worldwide outside of art, uh, which is fantastic. The only sad thing I think is that if, if we, one talks about schizo revolution, about uh, is that not everybody can be an artist. You know, it's all. It seems a bit idealistic sometimes. You know, um, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people just can't. Um, and they just stay in the, uh, in the medicated, really. Um, and then, for me, this also, this goes even further than, uh, but, but it's a metaphor or, or an image. So, Baudrillard ended in 2000, I forget the name of the last work he wrote. Um, sorry, but he, uh, he had the idea of escape of velocity, and he said there was no escape. That we're somehow running around the ring of a black hole, and the symbols that we use as artists are just symbols. They're, they're, they're firmly entrapped in the discourse. They'll never, you can't break out of it because, you know, capitalism just gobbles it all up and spits it out and gives you some money if you get lucky. Um, but. I actually think that what, is, what has happened is that if we, if we do think only on the level of symbols, and I think in my original strategy I talked about this strategy is symbolic, I think the strategy can't be symbolic anymore. The strategy is, is about understanding uh, networks. Um, Derrida talks about uh, you know, the interior and the exterior networks being like Arachne, the web. And I think what's, what we see now is that once, uh, and I'm doing a lot of research on neuroscience and artificial intelligence and uh, emotional artificial neural networks, they call them EMANs. Um, and I think what's happening is that our understanding of brain, the idea that there is no locus of memory, we only think in, we think in patterns, we remember patterns. So when, when, when data comes into our brains, we we actually re recall where the signals went and how they were um, mitigated by the amygdala. And that's exactly the kind of networks we're creating. So in, in a way, what we do is as we understand our own selves and as we create a new model of who we are, we actually project it onto the world. So either the internet is modeling us or we're modeling the internet both ways, actually. Um, and so the, the future is, is very difficult for us because it involves understanding enormously intricate webs. It, understand, it, it involves understanding, making probabilistic calculations, which we're terrible at. And um, it involves trying to figure out where, where we are or where our different parts of ourselves are in the network and, and who we relate to. And that's, it just becomes more and more difficult. And I think you get more and more casualties. 
and that's the real cause of this dichotomy in our society is where you have probably the people here who, who can handle it and then you have these enormous groups of people who are just totally intimidated by it and are left out in the cold and uh, it manifests as political decisions but actually it's it's understand it's, it's inability to understand the new modeling and I don't think we're, 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 we're good at it, let alone uh, people who are not educationally um, advantaged. So, but I don't, I don't know what the solution is, absolutely not. But as an artist, I think that's, that's the locus of, of attention now. I'm not sure, I wouldn't know how to do it as visual art, I think I know how to do it as verbal. I mean, the writing, not verbal, I'm terrible at speaking, obviously. <laughs> So with SPK, you, you took a very different direction in the 80s uh, with Sina. Um, could you maybe uh, tell the story uh, around about the, this uh, concert with uh, Chris and Cosey? Oh, yeah. Well, um, they invited us to go to, uh, that was in America, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. I. I I didn't really want to be there because we were doing a style of music that wasn't very, wasn't very useful for live. Um, I did a, one one year. I did a. I got a commercial contract um, just because I needed to buy a, one of the very first samplers in order to do something different. So I um, I did a commercial album, which was dreadful, and I'm so glad it failed because I would then have done another one and another one. Um, it's great for artists to have, to have significant failures, <laughs> and I'm very thankful. Um, but from then, I went. I went from this commercial period and, and did what I wanted to do, which was probably my favorite record called uh, Zami Lemani, which is to me the uh, what happens when you've thrown everything out and now you start to fill it again with new ideas. So, but on that, but live it didn't work very well because it was very ambient. And maybe finally, could you tell us more about your, your work as a sound composer for big movies? You know, because it's, uh, of course, we know the, the great soundtrack of The Crew, but uh, mm -hmm. there is not Thank you, yeah. just these films. Um, yeah, I, I was very lucky. One of the reasons I wrote uh, Zamir Lemani was because I had a, a kind of an operatic piece in mind, which was called In Flagrante Delicto. And, uh, it was nice that we got single of the week in England. I think about five people heard it, but fortunately one of them was a critic. And um, he, uh, from then I, I was very lucky that in Australia somebody heard it and, and put it on a movie, Nicole Kidman's first movie. And uh, so the, the, ori the original title of that record was called Music for Impossible Films because I really wanted to do it and I thought nobody would ever ask. So it, that worked out. And um, the other reason I really wanted to do soundtracks was because, uh, like I said before, when you're an artist, even if you're a fringe artist, your fans have an expectation that they're going to get the same thing, more or less, each time. And if you are changing, then you've got to totally remarket the whole project. And the time and energy taken to, to do that is, um, was prohibitive. So I, the, the idea of getting involved with soundtracks meant that I could reach hugely more people still change styles every you know couple of months and uh it was perfect for me really so um i think i probably have about a hundred films under maybe about 10 to 20 that i think were quite good um the crow being one and that was really the that was really the logical follow-up to zami Lamani, where i was taking um uh different lots of different cultural influences and really mutating them, um, putting them together. And I found that I actually had, a, had compositional expertise in putting really odd things together. People really enjoyed how I did it. And um, it's become, I mean, The Crow has been seminal. I mean, you don't have Game of Thrones soundtrack, for example, if you don't have The Crow. And now it's everybody imitates it. So that's kind of cool. <laughs>
and I sold three million records. So that was good. <laughs> so that was about a thousand times more than I sold at SPK. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, watch just a short uh, excerpt of uh, one of your gigs from this period and then uh, open the discussion if you have some questions to Graham. Part of uh, the same video, you can watch, <laughs> visit the exhibition, the actual, the actual one, um, just outside this uh, room. By the way, the the visuals were, were projected onto uh, uh, thirty meter high chimneys and so on. So it was more of a uh, more of a spectacular than a, than a music concert, obviously. <laughs> Do you have any questions? thinking about, I'll tell you a story, the, um, the original rhythm machine we had, we were probably one of the first with throwing gristle to get rid of the drummer, even though we later came back to it. Um, the only one I could afford was a Latin American one. Um, they had bossa nova, cha-cha, uh, what have the other ones, samba, salsa. Anyway, I found that if I pressed two or three buttons at the same time and then put everything through uh, Jimi Hendrix, guitar pedals and a, uh, and a um, bass rig and then cranked up the volume it sounded pretty good <laughs> but all the SPK rhythms are actually Latin American dance rhythms <laughs> and once you also brought a fair, a fair light does yeah. that change your life now in the, the, life. Yeah, in the way you, mm. you, you composed your song yeah. can you talk more about it maybe this aspect this Huge instrument for for the period from yeah, it was like the IBM you know, computer you know where you had the it was huge weight weight I don't know hundred kilos or something cost thirty thousand dollars so I had to prostitute myself to the whatever it was Warner Brothers record to get one <laughs> but immediately after I had it it became um, you know changed my life. So. It worked out, and then I could do the things like the insect musicians and things like that. Yes. This is a cover. And uh, obviously, making theme music also changed your life because you get yes more money than ever. Yeah. Um, you never regret no, never coming back to more underground uh, culture? No, no I don't because I didn't think, even after two records I felt like we had, um, that industrial music was almost over in the sense that we cleared out the body 
and um, then it was a matter of finding ways to, to you know, make new, new ideas, really. But I know it carried on, and a lot of other people did quite interesting stuff in the genre. Uh, not only this one, you have another uh, vinyl of uh, amphibians and uh, insect was really, really interesting at this oh, time. Thank you. And um, uh, we was hoping that uh, it was a new direction. New di direction, yes. <laughs> because we was also, uh, uh, after 85, it, it was this culture of industrial that was not anymore a counter culture, that was uh, kind of stupid and grotesque. Mm. And uh, all the industrial group have a chance. I mean, yeah. all of them never wanted to get this etiquette correct. And, uh, and we did not want to listen anymore to that also. Mm. But uh, the industrial, uh, who was the future of yeah. the music, yeah. they miss because uh, like techno culture arrived and there was a grandfather somewhere of the industrial future. Mm. And, uh, but uh, none of them succeed to pass the, the, the 90s. No, that's true. Uh, not anyone that tried to make techno uh, succeed to get uh, danceable music. Right. Uh, only boring music. So, yeah. um, and we were all uh, very fan of, uh, and maybe you don't remember, I went to see you in London. Uh, and uh, you make me discover of Deleuze, and I always uh, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I make you discover uh, Sioran also. Yes. And, uh, can you still read something like Sioran? Yeah. 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 Well, I can't anymore. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I take your point. Um, I mean, I've had a number of ideas along the way. I'll tell you one because I'm never going to do it, so if somebody else wants to do it, it's great. Um, if, if, do you know what a murmuration is? Do you call it murmuration of starlings in, uh, in French? You know starlings? These birds that do these beautiful sweeping patterns, millions of them. And, um, one of my ideas I've worked on for a long time, but I just couldn't do it anymore, was um, I had one, uh, one um, line of music for each starling. <laughs> so it's a motet in a thousand parts, which is pretty nice. The first like eight minutes, or no, not eight minutes, I'm going to say about a minute. It's about all I got done, because it's a lot of work. <laughs> but that would be pretty cool if somebody pulled it off. You know, just they just to, to write music for something that complicated. That's what I think the future is, and I think AIs AI is going to do it. When they start doing stuff, it's going to be really interesting. But right now, all they are doing is, is just sampling, you know, a genre and then producing something like you know, writing Mozart's 149th Symphony kind of thing. That's not interesting. But algorithmically. There is, a, there is a moment where composers and AIs together will do some really interesting stuff. Yeah, it's beautiful. We had to, the only reason I ever found that was that there was one library in South London in Bermondsey and somebody there, God bless them, had, had collected the entire collection of, um, oh gosh, what was it called? It was a New York company. Anyway, it was, it was the collection of ethnic music from the 1920s all the way. And uh, I guess that's all I used to listen to after about 1982, I suppose. Another one? Uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but I got you into uh, some recording experience about uh, electroshock treatment. Could you tell us more about it? Yeah, um, well, that was part of the job, you know. But it was pretty hard, the first one. It was a, basically uh, a lever, you know. It was almost like an industrial thing, or boom, like that. And then uh, would happen. And um, oddly enough, about half the patients thought it was quite good. It did them. It um, was sort of the last, the last cue of a depression. The sense that they were in this loop that they couldn't get out of. And some patients reported that it actually helped, but um, it certainly felt very, uh, very gothic. You know? And it still exists. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
exist, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does, yeah. yeah. I don't think lobotomies are done very much anymore, but I never I was never present at a lobotomy. But my first day on the on the asylum ward, I was on the night shift and a very big guy, he he didn't speak English, he'd somehow come to Australia from Bulgaria and he had the Bulgarian weightlifters physique. And he came down the corridor and there were like two inch thick reinforced glass uh, windows on all the isolation cells and he smashed all of them with his arms like pure adrenaline and um, bleeding just let beyond belief just bleeding everywhere and we had to force him to the ground and then call the doctor who was drunk and the, and the doctor gave me the syringe and said give him IV Valium I was like where's the fucking vein you know there was just <laughs> Like this, as my first day. <laughs> Completely illegal. I was not even trained, you know. But that's the kind of stuff that happened. It was like, you know, it was the old days, good old days. <laughs> I, should, I should have laughed, but you know, you do when it's horrific. What? What I liked about uh, what? what took my interest on, uh, on the whole movement is always the fact that everything happened more or less at the same time. If you look at Maurizio Bianchi and throw Bing Bristol and you got like some sort of a global telepathy. And um, did, you, did you guys have any reference or you as a SPK to the work of the Viennese actionists? Absolutely. Yeah. Because um, that there was a moment where there was some kind of a, a social driven uh, messages via body and um, hospital and clinic. Definitely, Otto Mill was, was one and uh, Kurt Krenn I think was the filmmaker. Um, yeah, there's one called Self Mutilation, that, that video that I really liked. Um, absolutely, that was a, um, an important precursor to the, the just the idea of the body as, as art and meat, you know. And uh, the, the connection, that there were connections be between you guys, like, uh, for example, Genesis Piorich worked a lot, and in Italy there was Vittorio Maroni. Yes. That was really to main art. Yeah. So, um, mainly it was exchanges and zines and main art between you guys. Uh, yes. Because yeah. what, what strikes me is that even the graphics were connected somehow. I mean, uh, when you look at the work from a couple of years later from White House yeah. uh, and you guys, there were kind of a flavor in graphic terms. Yeah. No, it's true. But, uh, but as I, I want, what I wanted to point out, and I hope I didn't get too um, boring, was that um, even though it's the same image, the interpretation is is slightly different. You know, like sometimes it was. But even even with my in my own band, the guy that did most of the videos was a friend of mine, and whenever he was asked why what these images were about, all he would ever say was, "Well, because they're not seen, and we're showing them." Mm -hmm. I'm like, going, "Well, it's a lot, about a lot more than that to me." <laughs> um, and so the same thing you get with uh, um, with the images of, of which I swear I did, I did not know that they they were doing that. Uh, that publication, even though it's almost identical. So, um, and I think the same thing goes for uh, interpretations of totalitarian images. Very different, inter very different reasons for for being interested in them. <coughs> for me, for for me, a, a long time before I became a musician, I had to study history in, in uh, university, and I was lucky to read Wilhelm Reich's. Um, Mass psychology of fascism, and he he said that uh, the reason fascism succeeded was uh, like through repression of sexuality, and I actually think, even though what would I know, I wasn't there. It was the opposite. It was a um, a, a sexualization. It was actually one of the most successful exercises in branding that the 20th century had. It wasn't called branding, but it was branding. When you think about it, all the symbols, all the, the clubs, all the marching, all the da 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 da, and everything was 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 branded with the symbol. It's not very different from Chanel, in my way of thinking. Um, and 
also both empires built on sex. And um, that's why I was interested in fascism, because I thought, well, this is just what everybody's doing. It's not, it's not actually, um, it, there's, no, uh, there's no them and us. It's all us. But I know that a lot of the others didn't, weren't looking at it that way. <laughs> They had previous to make a book uh, with you and the original SPK with the Dr. Hubert. And there was a lot of stories about that. And uh, I don't really understand what's happened. I don't know how it happened, actually. I, I, I know it's the one there, isn't it? Uh, well, Trevor Blake one? Yeah, the half and half one. Yeah, there's some, I mean, I don't know, actually don't know who that person was, and I only heard about it, I didn't ever saw it. Because he made one exam, one uh, exemplary of the, of the book, just one, but uh, oh. destroyed after, I think, and... Uh, okay. But, uh, and do you know if uh, the Dr. Hubert uh, from the SPK original is still uh, yeah. somewhere, or doing stuff? Um, I, I doubt it, um, but he didn't uh, go to jail as far as I know, which was quite strange. I know 11 of the patients did. Yeah, but he went out of uh, Germany, uh, of jail and tried to continue, because there was some link between them and the Rotterdam infection also. Yes, yeah, there was. So, it was all a bit fuzzy, uh, but I don't know if Dr. Hoover is still practicing. <laughs> questions, autres remarques, n'hésitez pas. I just want to maybe um, how did you meet Mark Mark Pauline with uh, the performance collective uh, survival research laboratories? Yeah, his 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 uh, thing is fabulous. He um, I think I met him with Vale when we first went to San Francisco, and um, he was there, so we met them, and he had just uh, catapulted a piano across the freeway, I think. That was the, what he just achieved the day before I missed it by a day. Uh, you know, like an eight-lane San Francisco freeway, and he managed to send a piano to the other side. That was pretty cool. Um, but he, uh, he, it's a little disappointing because he did such, made such beautiful machines and he could never tour Europe because he would have needed his own jumbo jet to get the stuff over here. Um, and he also, I think I bought him a, a book on cloning. This was 1982. I went down to City Lights, which was famous for having produced, you know, Brian Peason and all those guys. So I bought him a book on cloning because he'd just blown the fingers off his left hand. And I thought he needed some, to do something safer. <laughs> Clearly he didn't read the book. Um, and then the other, the one, the other I, one thing we did do, I remember, was uh, he also had a, um, a remote control. You talk about remote control in the early 80s. It's pretty, pretty forward. And he had this car chassis with a uh, with two sides on the front that would go like this and um, I think a Nixon mask was on the front and um, he remote controlled that and he would drive and this thing would be driving down the freeway and people in the, and we were in his car and people within this thing just would come past them on the freeway it was fabulous <laughs> he just said it's just so uh, he has, you know, a lot of um, important thoughts about why he's doing what he's doing, but it's also wonderful that it's funny when it happens. Yeah, we're also quite exciting about uh, Crash and all the universe of uh, Barat too. Mm. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, that is a really seminal book. Um, when I read, when I interviewed Ballard, I was I was so enthralled. I said that I thought he was like the Shakespeare of the 20th century, which he was horrified by. I said, no, no, that's way too much. But you know, Shakespeare was chronicling the breakdown of the of um, feudalism, 
and to the, the new ideas about the self at that time, very, very early ideas. That's what Hamlet's about. And um, Ballard really was, was chronicling the breakdown of, um, of uh, you know, state control in, in terms of uh, the, new, the new ideas of consent and seduction, which were, um, you know, have, have completely taken over how, how, we, how we think, how we work, the world around us. Everything's a model, everything's, everything's seductive. You know? Everything is selective. Should we stop there or another question? I think we'll do better than that. <laughs>